This evening's presenter, Jess Bry, is a senior horticulture interpreter for Ruth Ree Sullivan, oh, I'm sorry, Ruth Rhea Howell at Wave Hill in Bronx, New York. Jess is a Sullivan County born and raised gardener, interpreter, and artist. She has a professional master's degree in horticulture from Cornell University, where she studied native plant interpretation and design. An emerging leader in public garden industry, Jess has worked at Wave Hill and Queens, Bota Queens Botanical Gardens. She was a Sullivan Renaissance intern in 2009, where she cared for the gardens at the, as part of the Jeffersonville Gems. Thank you for joining us tonight, Jess. Hi there, everyone. Thanks, Carmela, for the introduction. You're welcome. Before I get started, um, can everyone see my screen? I should say Gardening 101. All right. Okay. All right. So during today's workshop, I'm going to cover soil health, plant selection, planting, and maintenance. I hope that after this presentation, you will have a more holistic view of gardening in Sullivan County. Underlying everything I say today is the mantra, right plant, right place. Now, this is a phrase spoken by many gardeners, but do you know what it really means? And how do you think of right plant, right place? If you have a piece of paper or your computer nearby, write down what you think this phrase means right now. And then we're gonna revisit it at the end of this presentation and see how your view has changed. So I'm gonna kick it off with soil health. I'll talk about soil types, what soil pH means, and soil amending. And so what is soil? Soil is made up of individual particles. There are three different types. We have sand, silt, and clay. Gravel is pretty much a, a very large sand. And so these particles, they vary in size and also the composition that they make up of your soil. And so I'll elaborate on that a little bit more later. Also in soil, we have water. This is of course, very important for plants. We have air. And so many may not realize, but soil is filled with many pores of air. And so when soil becomes compacted, that those pores are compressed and air is pushed out of the soil. And that is why soil compaction is bad. Without air, our plant roots would either rot or suffocate. And then finally, there's a bunch of other stuff in our soil, microorganisms, creatures such as worms, uh, plant roots, and then man-made materials that are considered anthropomorphic materials, such as garbage, lost garden tools, those kinds of things. And so throughout this presentation, I'm gonna play some videos of me in my garden in Sullivan County. This video here is gonna show you how to collect soil for analysis, which you can use to determine things like soil pH and soil composition. All right, I'm in a vegetable garden. Uh, these are raised beds uh, with some garlic planted behind me. It was planted last autumn and then covered with straw for insulation. We should have some garlic scapes in June and then the bulbs will be ready for harvest and drying sometime in July and August. In this part of the bed, we're gonna be sowing um, some sort of early um, spring vegetables like lettuce, arugula, or radish. So I wanna test the soil to see what the pH and the nitrogen content is because we top dressed it with topsoil and compost in the fall. And so we're gonna be mixing that in before we do the planting. And so 
prefer vegetable vegetable gardening vegetables really prefer neutral soil um, whereas with ornamental gardening with your shrubs and perennials the preferred range can really vary by species and so I just want to make sure that my soil which is a fantastic loamy mix uh, very loose lots of air which is really good for drainage and roots to permeate I just want to make that my, sure my soil is uh, around the neutral range and so you don't need much to collect you want to dig down or at least five inches I'm using a hori hori the blade measures about five inches so I can use that as a measurement measurement tool to know I'm getting deep enough if you don't want to use a little spade or you don't have a hori hori you could use a soil corer um, which uh, you just shove really hard into your ground and then when you pull it out it has a little core or cylinder of soil but you really don't need much to test. I'm gonna take this back inside and use my chemical soil tester to test the pH. All right, and so that's how you collect soil. <laughs> you really don't need too much. Like I mentioned, um, I had just about a handful. And actually to do soil testing, um, you really only need about two tablespoons to test your soil texture. And so soil texture is when you're going to determine um, how much sand, clay, or um, silt makes up your soil. And so this is really a hands-on um, test. And so it doesn't really work over video, but I'm gonna describe it as best as I can. Uh, these photos here uh, describe um, the field test, the ball test, and the ribbon test. Uh, I recommend that if you want to do this at home, just Google soil ribbon tests and you'll find lots of guides online that and videos that will detail you through the process. So that way you can actually have your soil in hand and follow along with the tutorial. But pretty much you just need a little bit of soil. You need to dampen it. It needs to be wet. Um, and so to do the ribbon test, you just want to have it damp enough so that the soil sticks together. Um, if it sticks together really easily without too much water, you probably have a clay dominant soil. If it's very loose and doesn't stick together at all, you probably have a sand dominated soil. To do the field tests, uh, you need even less soil, just kind of like a pinch, like a dime size uh, dop, uh, dollop, and you add a lot of water to that and then you kind of mix it around in the palm of your hand and it's gonna be really thin, kind of like a mud mask. And as you're rubbing that on your hand, depending on how gritty or not it is, it will help guide you um, on a chart um, to how sandy or not it is. And so I've been saying these soil textures over and over again, clay, silt, and sand. And so when you have your soil, you're probably not going to have 100% clay or 100% sand. I guess if you're gardening on a beach, <laughs> yes, you would have 100% sand. Um, but your soil is probably going to be an amalgam of sand, silt, and clay, or maybe just one or just two of those. And so when you're doing your soil test, you're not going to be able to get an exact ratio, but you're going to get some semblance that will give you an, a good idea. And the main reason you want to know um, what your soil texture is, is because of drainage. And so your soil texture is directly responsible for drainage. And so um, to kind of explain this on, I guess, a molecular level, um, the image on the right here, it shows like the uh, particle size of your soil textures. And so you have coarse sand, um, medium sand and fine sand, those are all sands, but from the circles you can see here, they are the largest particles. And then you have silt, which is that small dot right there in the middle, and then clay, there is no dot because clay, um, a single particle of clay is not um, visible to the human eye alone. You would need a magnifying glass or a microscope to actually see a single particle of clay. And so when you put all, if you just have a sandy site, like a beach, if you put the sand together, these are really big molecules. And when you put a big circle next to another big circle, there's kind of space around them because they don't fit perfectly together. But when you have clay, 
the surface area is very big. And so if you put lots of little particles of clay together, they kind of stick together, which is why um, you can make pottery with clay. It really sticks together. And so clay retains the most moisture because of that. Sand, on the other hand, because of all the space in between the particles, um, allows for the most drainage. And so moving on to testing your pH and for nutrients. There's a couple of different kits out there. There's chemical kits, um, analog and digital are kind of the most common ones that you'll see. A lot of houseplant owners have them and they kind of have spokes on the, on the mechanism that you stick into your moist soil. And then there's a hybrid, which is kind of a combination of chemical and analog. The two photos here are what chemical kits look like. You receive chemicals, as you could guess, to test your soil. And so the good thing about chemical tits, kits is that it can also test um, nutrient composition. And so before I go too deep into different types of kits, you need to ask yourself, how often are you going to be testing your soil? And what are you testing it for? And so if you think you're just gonna be testing your soil once before you put all your plants in, you may not, not, you may not need to buy a kit. You can visit your local um, Cornell Extension office, the one in Liberty, um, and you can either bring your soil with you or you can contact them in advance and they can tell you how to send your soil to Cornell for testing. And so those kinds of tests, they're gonna test for everything, the pH uh, and the presence of certain nutrients. And so the, of course there's a fee associated with that, but if you're only gonna be testing once, that's probably the easiest way to do it. If you think you're gonna be testing multiple different beds often, um, it might be worth buying a kit. And so I mentioned analog and digital. Those are the easiest. Um, you pretty much charge up the metal portion of the uh, tester and then you stick it into moist soil. I like to use chemical kits. I think it's mostly just because that's what I was trained on. The kit up in the right hand corner, you can buy that directly from Cornell. Um, there are three kits that you need to be able to accurately test your soil. Uh, there's one kit that you'll start with and it will tell you if your soil is either semi-alkaline or semi-acidic. And then from there, you can use an acidic test kit and an alkaline test kit to get a more detailed range of your pH. However, it doesn't test for nutrients. So the kit on the left, which is the kit I currently use, um, test your pH. It's not as accurate as the Cornell test kit, but it also has options to test for uh, nitrogen comp presence, um, magnesium, and a couple of other things. And so it just depends on what you think you need. But starting with Cornell Cooperative Extension is my recommendation because they have a lot of fantastic resources to elaborate on this, or they can do the testing for you. And so nutrients, I'm just gonna basically go over this. Um, and so there are macronutrients and micronutrients present in your soil, and they're present in a variety of different percents. And so macronutrients are your most important ones. Those are the ones that your plants need to survive. And so you have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. Nitrogen, you're probably very familiar with. It's necessary for plant growth. It's one of the main things that people amend soil with. Phosphorus is necessary for early root development. It's really popular for starting seedlings. And potassium increases drought resistance. Uh, your other um, nutrients are micronutrients. Those are iron, magnesium, boron, copper, and zinc. And the last one here, myobidium. And so those are not as necessary for the plant survival. If you're looking at this chart here, right in the middle, pH of seven, that's neutral. That's, that's perfect, that's the sweet spot. And so if you look through um, all these different bars that uh, signify our macro and micro, micronutrients, they, most of the bars are at their widest point at pH of seven. And that means that that is the pH where all of these nutrients 
are soluble to the plant. And so they're in the soil, but at certain pHs, they're not, the plant isn't able to pick up those nutrients, which is why if you don't test your soil and put the wrong plant in that can't um, absorb those nutrients at that correct pH level, those nutrients are insoluble to that plant. And that's when you end up with deficiencies. Um, iron and mag manganese um, are two that are really narrow, what, higher up on the scale when your soil is alkaline. So if you think of lime, lime is added to make soil more alkaline. It moves it away from acidic. So you get a lot of iron and manganese deficiencies in plants. Um, and that's because in alkaline soil, the, those two nutrients are not soluble to plants. And so this is a little nitty gritty, but I always like to cover it. And so amending soil, you're probably wondering already, okay, I know I have acidic soil, tell me how I can change it. Um, and so the honest answer is that you really can't. And so um, large garden design projects um, can modify the soil and that involves scraping off the soil, um, modif uh, amending it with either additional organic matter, fertilizers, um, adding more sand to allow for drainage, um, fixing compacted sites. Those are when you really want to bring in a professional and have a big scale job. Um, while at home, if you're just gardening um, as a hobbyist, um, it's a lot of work to amend your soil. And so just work with what you have, right plant, right place. <laughs> and so what you can do to amend your soil to make an impact in a feasible way, um, you can use leaf mold. Leaf mold is when you take, you collect leaves in the fall, you shred them, um, and then you apply them to your garden beds. And so by shredding them, you create, you increase the surface area and that encourages them to decompose and break down faster. Leaf mold adds organic matter and nitrogen carbon to your garden beds. It also can prevent weed growth. And so ornamental plants like your shrubs and perennials mostly never need fertilization and will thrive uh, in good quality soil conditions. And so that's the key, good quality soil conditions. Um, and so by doing your pH testing, your um, soil texture analysis, you're gonna know what you have um, before you start putting your plants in and spending lots of money so that you can determine if these conditions are gonna work for you or your plants that you're selecting, that's key. And so the next two do's really refer, refer to vegetable garden beds, annual garden beds or containers, something that is smaller, that is constantly getting turned over season after season. Um, there's high yield in there. Your nutrients um, are going to be um, depleted. And so you can amend with compost um, or fertilizer, such as manure, the autumn prior. And so you want to do it at the end of the growing season. You want to let it cure, hang out with your soil um, through the winter, and then at in the beginning of spring, just as the ground is starting to defrost, you're gonna turn over the top like six inches or so. You don't wanna turn the whole thing. Um, otherwise you could um, expose an unhidden uh, seed bed of weeds. And so it's always good to just turn the top um, and just work in that organic matter in the top six inches. And then also specifically in vegetable beds, um, in addition to always rotating your crops, you want to utilize cover crops. And so that is something like clover or um, uh, some sort of Fabiaceae, a bean, a legume, a nitrogen fixer that you sow um, at the beginning of autumn or the mid middle of autumn, you let that grow in and then you let the frost hit it and then early in spring, you're gonna turn in the top six inches um, way before you're planting in anything. That way it gives it time to rot and break down and work into your soil. Things you don't wanna do. You don't wanna plant directly into compost. Um, there's the potential that you could burn the foliage of your plant or in some cases burn the roots. And you also don't wanna use chemicals unless you are professionally trained. 
And so we've gotten to the portion where there's the opportunity to ask questions. There's still two more sections. Um, and so uh, I think plant selection is up next. So we're gonna have a question and answer section after that portion as well. So right now we're just gonna open it for questions about everything I've covered up to this point. I can't see the chat. Is there anything in the chat, Carmela? There's not. Does anybody have any questions at this point or we can just move on? Move on, thumbs up. Okay. We're getting a thumbs up to move on, Jess. All right, we're gonna power through. <laughs> All right, plant selection. So, um, testing pH and your soil texture, that's all part of site analysis. For your pH, you want to know if it is acidic, alkaline, neutral, or you might have a patchwork where your garden might have an acidic portion, a neutral portion, and then maybe you have a portion of your garden that has limestone deposits and you have the pH of 8.5. And so knowing that will determine what plant species you select because, because not all plants can grow in all of those pH ranges. Every, every plant has its preferred range. We talked about soil, your soil composition. Is it silt, sand, or clay based? Probably an amalgam. Moisture levels, so that's gonna be impacted by your soil composition. But also there's a couple of other things that can impact that. Is your garden gonna be located at the bottom of a hill and on a really rainy day, all the water is going to roll down that hill and collect in that garden? Um, where is your water table located? Um, I was planting a willow recently. There's gonna be a video of it later in this presentation where I knew it was a damp site, but I did not know that there was a spring located directly under where I was planting that willow. And I only found out when I was digging my hole and the water pulled up into that. And so when you're doing your site analysis, I mentioned digging down five inches to collect soil for testing, but you're also going to want to dig some holes and see what you find, see how rocky it is. Um, when you're digging the holes, you're gonna learn how compacted your soil is or isn't. You might be dealing with hard pan soil, which is never fun, <laughs> but it happens. And then finally exposure. And so uh, considering uh, how much sun your space receives. We're all very familiar with picking plants that are meant to flourish in shady gardens and then there's sunny gardens, but there's a whole lot in between dappled shade, part sun, afternoon sun only, morning sun only. Um, and so getting familiar with that. And then wind exposure. So Sullivan County is in the USDA grow zone 4B, 5A. It kind of shares both depending on what part of the county you're in. But if you're planting something in a fully exposed field on, in January, it might be negative 20 once you consider the wind chill. And so considering that when you're placing and selecting plants uh, could mean the survival or not of your plant. And so I have a couple of different plant palettes that I have put together um, considering Sullivan County's grow zones um, and semi deer resistance. Um, I'll point out if it is actually resistance resistant to deer and why. However, um, the best thing to do with gardening in Sullivan County and fighting the deer, if you can't install a deer fence, um, you have to have a really um, strict spraying um, routine where you use whichever deer repellent is most useful for you. Kind of like an allergy medicine, you might want to rotate between brands, um, but use what works for you. And so first plant palette that we're looking at is plants for acidic soil. And so pH, uh, is what I'm referring to here. And so seven is neutral. So anything less than that is considered acidic soil. First up is bear berry, uh, not bar berry. This one's a native um, and it's a very low growing uh, woody evergreen and it produces these red berries. 
the cultivar called Massachusetts um, has slightly larger leaves and produces more berries than the straight species. Sheep laurel here. Uh, so this is related to mountain laurel, as you can tell from the genus Calmia. And so sheep laurel guaranteed to be deer proof. Um, the leaves uh, contain toxic alkaloids. They may nipple, nibble on the leaves, but ingesting um, a large amount would probably kill a deer. <laughs> so you're pretty safe, safe with many laurels and there's lots of different cultivars out there and you get some really great colors. Griffith sport, spurge, uh, so many euphorbias are deer proof because they contain latex sap. Um, and so that is also something that is toxic to herbivores. Uh, Euphorbia griffy fire glow has um, a rosy uh, hue to its foliage and has uh, orange flowers on spikes. Uh, this is the only native plant in this collection of four that is not native to the United States. And then finally, flame azalea. No, azaleas are not deer proof. However, they are absolutely stunning, especially the flame azalea. And I think it is worth um, risking it. <laughs> All right, so these are plants for alkaline or neutral soils. So in my um, education and research, there aren't a lot of plants that only live and flourish in alkaline soil. There are just some plants that will flourish in neutral to alkaline soil. Whereas with our acidic plants, a lot of them that need acidic soil really only flourish in acidic soil. So. I can't tell you why, um, but it's just something that I've seen. So for our neutral or alkaline soil, this is Cornus alba. Uh, this is a red twig dogwood. There's also Cornus cerisia, uh, which is the native red twig dogwood. Cornus alba is not, but the cultivar West Sunburt uh, is the reddest red twig dogwood that's out there, that's on the market. And so if you will really want that really deep red that's long lasting, um, this is the plant for you. New England aster, really for, um, familiar perennial. Um, this is a dwarf cultivar called Purple Dome. Uh, the plants are less than a foot tall. So this gives you um, a pollinator friendly plant that you can put right at the front of your garden, um, whereas the street species is a little unwieldy and um, actually gets a lot of powdery mildew uh, late into the summer. Hydrangeas. <laughs> so people have lots of issues with hydrangeas because some hydrangeas only bloom on new wood and then some bloom on old wood. And so hydrangea arborescence, that's, this is a smooth hydrangea, it is native, it blooms on new wood. And so what I mean by new wood and old wood is that every season when the plant um, shoots out new growth, that's considered new wood. And so that is what this species, the smooth hydrangea, will create its flower buds on. And so the reason that uh, you can not get hydrangea blooms in Sullivan County is probably because you have a species of hydrangea that blooms on old wood. And so by blooming on old wood, that means that it's gonna bloom on last year's growth. That means it needs to make it through the winter and old wood bloomers like hydrangea macrophylla, uh, which is big leaf, um, hydrangea, they're the really like, they kind of look like cabbage leaves. Um, the plant itself is hardy to our zone, but its flower buds are not. And so when those 20 degree days come through, it zaps the flower buds on the old wood, and then you just get a leafy shrub and you don't get flowers, which is really the point of a hydrangea. So hydrangea arborescence uh, will bloom in Sullivan County because it blooms on new wood. And this cultivar, Hus Hollow, um, is a lace cap form, um, which is fantastic. And then finally, uh, bayberry. Uh, so this is another native. It is dioecious, though. Uh, so dioecious means that you the male and female flowers are on different plants. 
And so in order to get berries, you need a male bayberry and a female bayberry. Um, you only need one male plant and you can have 20 female plants. It's the same thing with hollies and winterberry. These are plants for the shade. So first up, we have wild ginger. Uh, this is blooming um, probably about now in Sullivan County. Uh, it has a cordate leaf, it's a heart-shaped leaf, very low to the ground. Um, and the flowers are kind of hidden underneath. So they're kind of like a little surprise. Um, this is a plant that's really valued for its foliage. There is also a European ginger, which has a glossy leaf, but the flowers are not as cool looking. Big root geranium um, is a really popular ground cover that is getting more popular right now because of its versatility. It can be used in shady gardens, dappled shade. It can flourish in a variety of different um, soil compositions, moisture levels. It can even handle some sun, um, but it's getting used as a replacement for Pakistandra by a lot of people, um, which is kind of becoming an invasive in parts of the country. Um, but this one, uh, the flowers uh, bloom around the same time as wild ginger, but on long spikes above the foliage. And it also kind of functions like a ground cover. River birch, very popular. Um, this one in particular, Little King, uh, the cultivar is a dwarf cultivar. And so it's not very small. I think it tops out around like eight or 10 feet, but the straight species tops out probably closer to like 17, 20 feet. So if you have a smaller space, um, this is a great plant. It also does very well in the shade. And then finally, finally Hakone grass. So this um, cultivar Abla aurea uh, is a variegated one. So it has a yellow and green tinge to the blades of grass. There is also, um, I just forgot the cultivar name there. Is, oh, all gold. There's a gold cultivar, which is just all yellow. And then the straight species is fully green. And so these are kind of like a mounding grass. It kind of looks like a waterfall, very low growing to the ground. Actually, all three of these herbaceous plants are very low growing to the ground. Plants for full sun. You have a lot to work with here. A lot of prairie plants. These are just some um, of my favorites and they're very reliable. So this is Sweet Coneflower, cultivar Henry Eilers, has a really thin petal, makes it look very unique. It does need staking. However, you can try to prevent the need for staking and flopping over by pinching early in the season. And I will elaborate more on that when we get to the schedule that I'll go over. This is the first vine, uh, and actually the only vine uh, that I'll have in the list. And that's nothing against vines. Um, this is the yellow trumpet vine, Campsus radicans form a flava. And so um, if you want the yellow one, you do need the one that has the name form a flava in it. And so that's just part of the scientific name. We also have yucca, um, also called Adam's needle. This one um, functions great in full sun, of course, but it also creates a very um, large and impressive flower stalk every other year, only produces it in its second year. And then finally, uh, switchgrass, cultivar Shenandoah has a red color to it. Oh, sorry, one more, wet conditions. <laughs> um, so we have our black pussy willow, I will talk more about this plant because it's the willow that I end up planting in the video later on. Dwarf button bush, sugar shack. Um, so if you get straight cephalanthus occidentalis, it is a very large shrub. Um, it can be, gosh, um, probably like six feet wide by six feet tall uh, once mature or even larger if it's in a wet area that, and it's very happy. Sugar shack, much smaller, maybe like three by three, four by four max. And you also get these fantastic red seed heads at the end of the season. Another dwarf cultivar, Baby Joe, uh, for Joe Pie Weed, tops out usually around three feet instead of the six to eight feet of the straight species. And then Cardinal Flower, really fantastic plant to attract hummingbirds. 
Okay, questions about plant selection? Okay, I have a question. It's about soil. Um, okay, better Julia, late than never. <laughs> Julia asked, um, if your soil is less than ideal, would you suggest using raised beds? I assume they're talking about vegetable gardening. Um, so yeah, um, with vegetable garden, it's a whole other ball game. Um, like I mentioned, when I was collecting soil samples, you really want to have neutral soil um, for gardening and you really want that loamy mix. Um, so that's that sweet spot, um, which honestly is really hard to come by. And so I would definitely recommend raised beds. Raised beds are just always good anyway, unless you're getting your soil tested for lead, because uh, you never know what might have leached in there, like um, even from your own foundation, um, from the concrete. Um, and not all plants um, take up lead and keep it in the edible portion, um, but some do. And you just always want to be really careful about that. So raised beds are a really easy way to avoid that. Great. I'm looking to see if anybody, anybody else have any questions? Got a quiet group. There's, right. a, there's another in chat. Oh, I see it. Till versus no till, getting mis, mixed opinions. From, from everyone? <laughs> I don't think I covered that. Um, but yeah, um, you know, everyone has their own opinion. Um, no till or no dig has become very popular recently. Um, it is much easier because um, if you don't have a, a rototiller, how can you really till um, your area? And so a lot of people have doing, been doing no till. Um, I would, I'm kind of pro no-till, uh, just because of all that I know about what is in the soil. Um, when you till, you break up all of that soil composition. Um, you're breaking up all of those um, mycorrhizal connections and everything, and you're kind of just like exploding everything up. And so I don't really like to till. Um, however, if it, I know plenty of people that have always an detailed and everything grows fantastically. So I don't think there's anything bad about it. So it's really up to you. Is phlox, is phlox suitable for a garden? Phlox? Yes, definitely. Um, so there are lots of different phloxes. Um, most of them are categorized by either spring blooming or summer blooming. And so spring blooming flocks are woodland flocks, um, mossy flocks, the kind of ground cover one. Um, they're absolutely fantastic plants. And they, but they, the mossy flocks, the kind of carpeted one, it needs full sun. Whereas some of the woodland ones um, really need a lot of moisture. Um, so it really depends on what species. Um, funny enough, um, on my blog, I just did a whole piece on spring uh, flowering flocks um, that I really dive deep into. Uh, so if you're interested in that, check that out. Uh, if you're referring to the kind of more classical arts and crafts flocks, which is garden flocks, Phlox paniculata, um, that's also a really great one. You do have to be careful about powdery white mildew because they're really susceptible to that. There are some cultivars that are resistant uh, to learn more about garden flax that might be the best for you, check out Mount Cuba Center. They do um, a series of trials every four years and they just wrapped up one on garden flax. And so they kind of detail out which cultivars are powdery mildew resistant, which ones don't flop over, that kind of thing. And that way you can pick one that is good for your garden. Okay, we have a few more questions. Um, is there a good resource you can recommend for how to plan for multi-season beauty in plant in plant selection? Mm. So that's just gonna, any resource really. It's just really getting familiar with what's out there. And so you can create multi-season interest by even just planting grasses so and leaving them. And so um, you can use the 
panicum grass, the switchgrass that I recommended, Shenandoah. And so it starts coming up now, um, but, and it will get its red cultivar uh, glow. And then when winter comes around, don't cut that grass down. That way it's still interesting looking. Um, it's also really good um, habitat for uh, insects or hibernating mammals. Um, but you can really play with all season interests, but also you're, you don't have to always have a garden that is interesting all year long. You can just have multiple gardens and maybe one garden, it's big show is in the spring and you have mossy flocks in it, or you have tulips. And then you have your sunny, sun, summer garden, which has your um, prairie perennials, your grasses. And then you have a garden that it's big highlight is winter where you have your red twig dogwoods um, or yellow twig dogwoods and some other shrubbies, evergreen perennials in it or evergreen um, woodies in it. And so you can always intermix those things and have all your gardens be interesting year round or you can do that. <laughs> That's a great idea. I never thought of it that way. Um, Another question in, is there a bamboo that can grow in part sun and dry sandy soil? Oof. Um, <laughs> I would not recommend planting a bamboo unless you're going to keep it in a container because otherwise you're only going to have bamboo. <laughs> it, it's a very vigorous grower, so it's, it's a rough plant. <laughs> I think that is it for the chat right now. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, I think we can forge ahead. All right. Wake up my computer. All right, so this is the last section, planting and maintenance. It has a lot of videos in it, so it'll be a little longer. So we have our garden schedule. In January, usually that is, Seed shopping time. It seems to be getting earlier and earlier though. During February, you can clean and sharpen your tools. You can also do something called winter sow, which um, you'll need to do if you have any native plants that you're growing from seed. And so pretty much winter sow means um, you're going to be sowing seeds and then placing them outside for something called cold stratification. And so stratification, I'll get into that a little bit more detail in a second, um, but that um, allows the seed to germinate. Ma March, prune your fruit trees, um, begin deer preventative measures. So March may seem very early, but if you're starting to take down your fencing from around your shrubs or anything else, you're gonna need to immediately start spraying because deer are really hungry at this point and they might eat off all your leaf and flower buds, which are very tender and very delicious. And then in April, you start your other seeds. And so um, you wanna start your seeds by counting back from your last frost date. Um, and so if I was starting seeds in New York City, I'm gonna start them probably in March, but last frost date for Sullivan County, usually is around the end of May, beginning of June. So April is really the time. You don't wanna start your seeds inside too early unless you have a greenhouse to move them into. They'll be too big. And so in this video, I'm gonna go over some basics for seed starting. I'm gonna be showing you how to plant seeds. So I have a Black Eyed Susan vine here. It's a Thumbergii. And I soaked the seeds in lukewarm water for 24 hours. And so the reason I did that is because it is a method of scarification. Scarification refers to a variety of different methods that per allow moisture to permeate the seed coat to trigger germination. You can scarify by using warm water. Uh, you can scratch it on objects. You can clip it with a um, a uh, nail clipper, and then there's also stratification, which typically is cold stratification, which is when seeds require a period of coldness. Um, so many 
native plants required cold stratification, which requires you start you sow them outside in November. And so I have my seeds here. I already drained the water. I have my uh, my cells, and then I have a couple of different ingredients. I'm going to start off by putting some gravel in the bottom of my seed cells. I'm just going to do three. And so the reason that I just put a little bit of gravel is for good drainage, but it also weighs down my container, which is very, very light without the gravel. After that, I'm going to put in my seed mixture. Um, you can use uh, seed starting mixes uh, if you would like. I have a mixture of uh, like Miracle Grow, a uh, just general potty mix with uh, gravelly sand, which is called quartz sand if you would like to purchase some. And so the sand and the the seed starting mix, the, this seed starting mix is half potting soil, half seed, a one to one ratio. And so the seed, the sand allows for a really good drainage and the two materials together allow for easy root permeation. All right, so I was pressing down here because that's called tamping down. And so I'm just squeezing out a little bit of the air that might have formed while I was pouring that in. The According to the packet, these need to be, oh, I have a hard time getting the seeds out. These need to be um, half an inch, I think. Let's see what it says. Half an inch planting depth. So I actually have a little bit too much. So I'm gonna dump this out. It's actually quite, it's quite deep. Oh, uh, that was, let me pour out a little more. Worst thing you can do is plant your seeds at the incorrect height. So I'm gonna put seed number one there, seed number two there. You can sow all your seeds together and then uh, separate them out, but I am not doing that. I chose not to. Some species like uh, sweet peas do not like being mass planted together because they don't like their roots being disturbed. Um, I'm honestly not sure for this species if it is okay with that because I wasn't planning to do it. So I'm just putting a little bit of quartz sand on top and that is to hold down the seed starting mixture because it's heat based and it's very light and this prevents it from kind of bubbling up and floating up to the top. And then I'm going to water it in. All right, so you saw that eight, day, eight days later, this is probably 12 or 16 days later. So they're still going. Um, let me see. So I just wanna point out something here. And so when your seeds come up, they produce what are called cotyledons, which are these two right here. Um, you can either have two cotyledons or one cotyledon. If you have one cotyledon, you have what's called a monocot. If you have two, you have a dicot. And so plants that are monocot are like corn. It's really fast growing. Um, most of your um, herbaceous, if your herbaceous ornamental plants um, would be dicots. Grasses are another monocot. If it grows fast, it's probably a monocot. Um, and so these are not true leaves. They'll actually die off once the plant gets large enough. This right here are are true leaves right here. And so I'm actually really happy that these are doing very good. They're in my new city apartment. <laughs> I wasn't sure, <laughs> but that's how you start seed. Come on, go next page. There we go. All right, so something else that you can do in April is called spring cutback. In this video, we'll show you what that means. So if you haven't done any spring cutback yet, now is the time to do that. 
And so what I mean by spring cup is on perennials and grasses, this is a Hakone grass. This is all last year's growth. And so right now I can just easily pull this away. And so put that in a bucket. And so by doing that, we can then allow this year's growth to get access to sunlight, water, nutrients, and also the grasses here you can add to your compost bin. Uh, some people actually use them to um, as like a renewable mulch. I think it looks pretty gross. So we're just gonna get rid of that. Um, perennials, last year's growth and also the seed heads. So it's really good to remove the seed heads unless you want to encourage um, little volunteers throughout your garden. So this is a Stilby chiensis. Um, it's a pink cultivar, but pretty much these also, um, these are very woody stems. They kind of just, you wiggle them and you pull them out. If you have difficulty, you can use a pair of pruning shears. Um, and also, let's see, on our woodies, this is physocarpus, nine bark. Um, cutback should have been done already on these because as you can see they're already leafed out. However, I am going to remove anything that's damaged. And by damaged, I mean broken off. And this was broken off by deer probably. And so I'm going to use pruners for this. And so it's always good when pruning, especially on woodies, to follow the 3Ds to remove anything that is damaged, dying, or diseased. And so this is damaged and also dead. So it's always good to remove that from your woodies. That way they don't have to worry about it. And at least in the case of trees, it doesn't fall off during a storm and further uh, cause further image injury to the tree. So that is spring cutback. All right, so we're getting into, oh, divide perennials also still in April. Depending on what species of perennial though, you can do some of this still in May. In this example, um, I'm gonna show pasta dividing, which is something that it's already too late to do. And I'll explain why. All right, so early spring, uh, which is now, is a good time to separate hostas. And so as we know, hostas are kind of like deer candy. Um, but if you do have them in your yard and are used to spraying them to prevent deer from eating them, they're a really great foliage to add to any shade garden. I am separating some old hostas right now. They're probably about 10 years old, so they've become way too large for the garden that they live in. And separating them right now is the time to do it. And so I have split this hosta right here um, directly in half with a sharp spade and I'm going to split it again, but I'm not gonna use a spade to do it. So, so with hostas, um, you have something called hosta eyes, which are these parts right here, which is the leaves of the hosta, and they're all curled up and they haven't unfurled yet. And this is the time that you want to separate your hostas. The eyes should just start showing, which is what they are like here. They're very tightly wound still. The reason for that is that if you separate them while they're further along, you have the potential of damaging the foliage, which is the whole reason you have a hosta. And so I'm gonna show you some tools to use to separate this further. And there are, according to the internet, some uh, varieties or cultivars of hostas that you can separate by hand very delicately but I've been doing this all afternoon and I have not found that to be the case it might be because they're so old and the roots are so wrapped around one another that you can't really separate like by eye um, so I can separate the little ones on top but I'm just gonna cut it right in the middle and try to make a cut that does the least amount of damage. Woo! All right, so I'm gonna bring it to you. 
This is a cut hosta. See how I sliced with the hori hori so the ones on the edge are kind of a little destroyed, but it should be fine. When you plant it, plant it at the exact same height that it came out of. And so now I have three hosta plants from one. And I actually gave some of those hostas to a friend of mine who went and planted them and they're already coming up. So they didn't die. <laughs> Even at a stage in my career as a horticulturist, I'm still always like relieved when I plant something or separate something and replant it and it doesn't die. That feeling never leaves. <laughs> All right, now we're into May. We've caught up. So, um, like I said before, last predicted frost is usually around Memorial Day. Um, you want to be hardening your seedlings off. Um, so you can start doing that now. And so hardening means that you're going to be exposing your sunlight, your seedlings to the elements uh, very slowly. So you're going to start with doing a couple hours at a time, um, maybe putting them in the shade outside for the first couple days to get them used to the wind. It will help strengthen their stem, but you're not gonna leave them outside um, at night until after last frost, because then you have the potential of your seedlings getting hit by the frost and dying. You can also plant certain species in your vegetable garden right now. Um, they can be um, plants like a, uh, lettuce and arugula and radishes those can be planted before uh, your last frost but a lot of stuff you have to wait until after the frost has passed and then planting woodies and perennials um you can do that in april but you're kind of pushing it depending on where you bought your plants like if you went down to orange county and bought them they are at least a week or two ahead of the time and then if you bring it up to sullivan county there's a potential that they could get frostbitten and you can continue planting woodies and perennials into June. You're gonna to wanna to stop and take a break probably in July, August, September, uh, unless you are okay with constant watering. And so May and June is really the sweet spot for planting woodies and perennials. You can also plant your annuals in June because our last frost has passed. And so finally, the willow that I have been talking about, this is a video of me planting it. All right, so we're planting two willow shrubs today, uh, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the ecosystem that we're within. So this is a wetland. Uh, there's a natural spring running through. You can actually see it pulling up in one of the holes that we dug for the willows. Uh, we have native carex grasses here um, and some other things growing, but this area that we're planting the willows in is kind of the wetland area, and we think that the willows will do really well here and definitely planting any other species here it would perish <laughs> um, and the reason for that is the soil that we have here uh, is clay um, so it's a very wet area and then on top of that there's a very water retentive soil and so clay soils are characterized by very small particles of silt so there's a high percent of silt in this soil and when the water hits it, all the little small molecules kind of glue together, and that's when you get clay, which, is, has, which has been used to make things such as clay pottery. And so I've already dug my hole. I don't need to worry about watering, because as you can see, the spring is already filling the hole. So it should be interesting to see how these willows do, if they'll grow really fast. Move this shovel out of the way. Uh, some tools that I used to dig the hole, of course, were a shovel, but because so most of Sullivan County is very rocky, um, I use a Matic pickaxe combo. So I use the pick side to break through rock because it's very pointed, and then Maddocks are really helpful for getting underneath. I get underneath, and then I kind of use my own body weight to kind of pry up the stones. And so that actually allows me to dig holes pretty much wherever I want, unless of course there is a boulder um, that it won't do much with. But anyway, so I'm gonna plant our willow. This is um, black pussy willow, Salix melostaches. The little buds on it before flowering are black. 
I also planted a Salix Discolor, which is a white pussy willow. And I'm just pushing on the side of this pot to loosen it. I foresee it might be a little pot brown because the roots are growing out of the bottom. So let me loosen those up a little bit. All right, let's see if I can get this out. There we go, yes. All right, so we have a pot bound shrub. And so, why don't you zoom in on the roots right there? I'm gonna get my tool for that. So for pot bound shrubs, I use a handsaw. And so, um, I'm gonna make a series of cuts on the side that pretty much I'm gonna be slicing through the roots. And pot bound shrubs, the roots are encircling. And so by cutting them, I'm gonna prevent the shrub from strangling itself and also encourage growth outside of the hole that I've dug. And so some people might think that this is a little extreme, but it has worked very fantastic for me. And I get a lot of growth on shrubs that I plant. Get this out of here. If it's not working to slice it, you can also do this to get through those big ones, which I do on the bottom. We're on a little bit of a hill here, so it's kind of rolling away from me. All right. That is, all right, that's good enough. All right, so now you take your shrub, stick it in your hole, and you wanna make sure that the top of the root ball is at the same height as the ground, and this is really good, this is a good height. Um, the top here, uh, you'll find this on the top of a lot of nursery shrubs. These are rice holes. And then these little circular things are slow release, slow release fertilizer. And so they add the rice holes for water retention. That's okay if it gets in your hole. And so I'm gonna fill it in with soil, kind of compress it down a little bit, not too much because like I pointed out, this is a clay and I don't wanna completely waterlog the hole that it's in. Um, and I will not need to water it in. And that's how you plant a willow. And so I need to correct my past self. I was talking about clay soil and it is not silt particles, it's just clay particles. Silt is something different. And so um, usually when you plant uh, woodies, um, when you're filling in the soil around the root ball, I use um, the handle portion of my shovel. I turn it upside down and I use that to kind of poke the new the soil that I'm filling the hole in with um, and that um, pre prevents the plant from settling and then you kind of get a divot around it and so that is kind of pushing all the air out of it and so we don't want to push all the air out of it out of our soil of course uh, but just poking it uh, pretty harshly with a um, shovel handle won't remove all of that but I didn't do it in this case because it was you could have made a clay pot out of this soil. So it was, it's a very um, extreme example. Typically you're not planting into straight clay in a, um, on top of a spring. <laughs> All right, so moving into July, um, you can stake your perennials, uh, also pinch perennials and annuals. And so pinching um, is not the same as deadheading, however, uh, they both modify the same growth hormone called auxin, which is responsible for the growth of plant tips. And so by pinching, you're cutting off the plant's auxin supply, which then triggers branching. And so when you are pinching, you usually remove just the top set or two of leaves. Um, and you want to do it when the plant is young, but not so young that it only has one set of true leaves. And so that goes back to the seedlings I was talking about before, where it has the cotyledon leaves and then a set of true leaves. Um, so in this illustration, I tried to show uh, there are a total of three sets of leaves, 
Um, and I would only remove the top set of leaves. I wouldn't remove the two top sets because then it wouldn't leave much behind. And so the reasons that you can plant early in the season are to encourage bushier growth and lateral branching. And so that can help keep your certain species uh, shorter and bushier. Remember that uh, Rudbeckia cultivar Henry Eilers, and it can also increase, um, encourage more flowers. And so plants that benefit from pinching, coleus, dahlias, you'll only get multiple dahlia flowers if you pinch. Um, Fox paniculata, that's that garden fox we were talking about earlier, Rudbeckia species, um, solidaria, which is goldenrod, petunias, many more. In August, um, deadhead perennials, also sit back and enjoy your flowers. In September, uh, for vegetable gardening, continue to harvest. Um, it's a good time to plant your cover crop in any of your finished beds. In October, place wire, burlap, fencing, build moats, whatever you need to do to prevent the deer from eating your shrubs. And rubbing their horns on their shrubs. That's actually um, something that I experience will actually kill more of my woodies than them actually eating it. Because if they eat the plant, it will just like not bloom in one portion. But I've had deer actually just like completely um, decimate um, syringa, um, which is uh, lilac bushes from rubbing the velvet off of their horns. Uh, apply compost to beds in November. And then in December, begin planning for the next year. And so we've reached the end of the presentation or workshop. Um, before I answer any remaining questions, I want to encourage you all to think about what this phrase, right plant, right place, now means to you. And I hope that you learned at least one new thing and plan to apply that new knowledge in your garden this season. And so thank you, everyone. Um, if you liked what I'm talking about and sharing, you can continue to follow me. Um, on Instagram, I'm really active. My handle is J-E-S-S -S underscore B-R-E-Y or my website, J-E-S-B-R-E-Y dot com. I mentioned the Fox post, but I try to write something every month. And so I'm going to unshare my screen so that I can see you all and answer any remaining questions. Okay, we do have some questions. I just have to find now where it is. Um, there was one question about uh, seed starting. Will a seed have a better chance if I start them in a moist paper towel? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, there are some seeds that you do need to start in paper towels. Um, a lot of tropicals, like if you want to grow your own avocado tree or mango tree from the pit, um, after you've cleaned off, um, there, there's always like kind of like a casing on those types of seeds. So you need to either like remove the hull or the skin on the pit in that case. Um, but then you wrap them up in a moist paper towel and leave them for a couple weeks until the radical, which is the first root that will come out of a seed, um, appears. But other than um, those like specialty um, seeds, it's much better if you sow them in uh, soil because they're, most plants don't like their roots disturbed. And a lot of the plants that you're gonna be growing for either your vegetable garden or as annuals and perennial ornamental plants, they're gonna have really small roots. And so you don't wanna just, you want to disturb them at the least amount possible. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, I see uh, Charlie in a minute, uh, and then we have another one that's, how do you start a forsythia? Ooh, that's a fun question. Um, so of course you can buy one in the shop. However, forsythia is, a woody plant that responds very well um, by harvesting softwood cuttings. And so if you have a friend that has a forsythia that um, is a unique cultivar, like there is a gold leaf forsythia um, that I have my eyes on, it's a hybrid. Um, and you can take a cutting um, of the forsythia and it can 
For Cynthia, I believe it should just be able to propagate in water. You just cut it and then put it right in water. If you don't have a cup of water nearby and you're traveling, uh, snip it again before you put it in the water. That way you open up that wound again. Um, willows um, produce a hormone naturally that encourages um, root growth. So you just cut your willow uh, branch and you can stick that in water. Um, for Cynthia though, if you wanna speed it along, you can dip it in a rooting hormone. Uh, they make either liquid or powdered forms. You coat the cut area and then you stick it in water. Or sometimes you can stick it directly in soil, but the chances of it rooting aren't as high. So I always like to stick them in water. Great. Um, Charlie, see your hand up. There we go, I'm unmuted now. Um, we're just starting on a grassy area of, of lawn. We've decided to make a raised flower garden for this summer. And when I was reading up on it, I had already removed the sod and found that this, the soil is really clay. It's upstate New York around in uh, a place called Union Springs. It's not Cayuga Lake, but that's where our, I'm planting this garden. And I just didn't know there was a lot of different ways to go about starting a raised bed garden. And we didn't know which would the next step be. You know, some people say newspaper, some people say paper bags, some people say it's definitely clay. So we're going to have to, I'm thinking of ordering a load of topsoil to come in and, and just not have to deal with the clay because I just dealt with it trying to get it out. And it, like you said, you can make clay pots out of it. It's really something. But I mean, a, a procedure for converting a, a lawn area into a, a perennial or a annual flower garden or a perennial. So mm -hmm. what your thoughts would be on how to proceed? Sure. Um, well, it depends on what you're going to plant. If you are planting annuals, you can just bring in a load of topsoil and put that on top because annual plants um, are going to have like really big, deep tap roots. So they're not going to probably even hit the, um, the clay uh, if you put a heavy enough layer down. Um, if you are going to be growing vegetables, uh, you might want to have like, a, okay, ornamental. So um, you can really select species that are going to function well in that area. Um, if you truck in um, a load of topsoil and just lay it on top, um, unless you plan on bringing in like six feet of topsoil and making it like a really raised bed, um, you're, get, you're gonna end up digging into that clay eventually. And so when building, if you are gonna build raised beds that are that big, it is possible, but you're gonna wanna reinforce it um, with wood chips or actual logs. Um, there are some gardens that will reinforce it with wire. They kind of create a structure um, with the soil and then they leave a hole for the plant to go into. There's a lot of um, rose gardens that will um, grow roses that way uh, to keep their roots out of water. Um, so I would, I would look into that. Um, it is a lot more work though, for sure, but then it keeps the roots out of the clay. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Anyone else with any questions, comments? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Jess. I learned a few things for sure. And um, oh, you're clapping in, Louise. Uh, yeah, thanks for all your uh, great insight. And 